Native people, Native culture, Native knowledge. Hi, I'm Jeannie Green, bringing you award-winning Heartbeat Alaska. Bringing you national and international Native news, this is award-winning Heartbeat Alaska, the premier Native voice in Native programming. There's a heartbeat loud as thunder Revolution is in the air There's a heartbeat deep inside our mother Are you too cool to care? Yeah, with Heartbeat Alaska, here's Jeannie Green. Hello, welcome to Heartbeat Alaska, Native news and Native information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so very much for joining us. Today we continue our journey north, this time to Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory, a place with a fascinating name and fascinating residence. We'll be back with Whitehorse right after this. Hello, Heartbeat Alaska, and welcome to Whitehorse Yukon. <laughs> Support for this program provided by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. We've been here since before Alaska was a state, and we'll be here when you need us. We're here. We're with you. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. Six months ago, Claire made a promise to her family and to herself. The promise was she'd quit smoking by the time her next birthday came around. And already she's feeling better. She has more stamina, more energy, and her lungs are stronger than ever before. BP, working for Alaska. Hey everyone. Help us welcome one of our new sponsors, Wave Wholesale Company, your one-stop supply source for village retail stores, food service customers, and government agencies. Welcome aboard, Wave. Executive Suite Hotel is the official hotel of Heartbeat Alaska. When you come to town, make sure you stay there and ask for your free Heartbeat Alaska baseball hat, one per registration, please. There's a heartbeat out of thunder Revolution is in the air We here in the North are surrounded by communities with colorful names names such as Mary's Igloo and my favorite Point Hope Traveling to Canada we visit Whitehorse an intriguing name and intriguing people uh, the town got its name actually from uh, from a uh, from the uh, white. It's it's actually a, a white horse and and uh, it was it came from First Nations origin uh, about white white horses that uh, were uh, seen in the area, which weren't really native to the to the to the Yukon region. White horse. Many people ask where the name comes from. It's a good question, since the origin is integral to the history of the city itself. Many people believe that because downstream from the rushing river of Miles Canyon, a violent set of rapids reminded early travelers of the manes of charging white horses. Others say that the First Nations people's ancestors of this area saw a white horse in this area. Whatever the reason for the name, this community of 23,000 people has a fascinating history. Whitehorse really started back in the time of the gold rush as everybody was, was trekking to the Klondike gold fields. They all filtered through Whitehorse and the riverboats came through here and this was a natural place to stop. They had just got through the Miles Canyon 
which were which were one of the most uh, dangerous sets of, of rapids on the trek after they got over the, the Chilkoot. So about 40 to 50,000 people passed through this area on their way to the Klondike Goldfield. So that was the start of uh, Whitehorse really as a, uh, as a transportation center and, and, an, and an outfitting center for uh, people heading to the Klondike Goldfields in 1898-1899. Uh, uh, became incorporated uh, as a city in 1950, 50 years ago, and became the capital of the Yukon in 1952. Before that, it was in Dawson. Before that, the capital was in Dawson City. Uh, the economic base of the community, it is the transportation and supply hub for the entire Yukon. Uh, mining and tourism are the two primary industries across the territory. And of course, Whitehorse supplies uh, all of the regions and is, is the regional transportation center. How did it become so? It uh, became such really in uh, 1952 when it became the capital. In the late 40s, early 50s, the uh, Dawson Gold Mining, the Yukon Consolidated Gold Corporation had really ceased operations. Population had dwindled and this had become a transportation hub. So what happened is really the center of government decided to move where the greatest concentration of population and access to transportation routes was. And uh, thus Whitehorse grew from 1950s, from in, in the 50s forward. Uh, servicing that, as well as a large population settled here uh, of armed armed forces during the uh, when they were building the Alaska Highway during the Second World War, started the transportation, the the airports, and a lot of the infrastructure that we see was uh, was built during that uh, period. Welcome to LePage Park uh, and the continuing celebration of uh, Aboriginal Day. It's it's it is a national uh, celebration uh, for us. The banks didn't close. I wasn't impressed. There, there were Aboriginal people here because of the confluences in the uh, river. There were there, there, there remains. Uh, there were Aboriginal settlements both around the entire Whitehorse area because most of the, the, the Whitehorse First Nations were all river people. So their, their settlements were around the uh, river areas. Heartbeat Alaska correspondent Mark Sable arrived in Whitehorse just in time to help celebrate National Aboriginal Day, a federal holiday, and a day held dear to the First Nations people of this country. I am the Grand Chief of the Council of Yukon First Nations, uh, here in, uh, representing uh, 11 Aboriginal communities. Uh, I work with 11 community chiefs uh, on territorial, uh, national and international issues for Indigenous peoples here. This day is uh, being celebrated all across the country by uh, all the provinces, all the territories, and uh, in particular by all the Aboriginal peoples across the country. For us, it's been that uh, there's all kinds of national recognition days or national holidays uh, for different groups of peoples, uh, uh, for different events, uh, none of which celebrated, like for here in Yukon, there's uh, a territorial holiday called Discovery uh, day, which uh, is the this, it celebrates the discovery of gold in the territory, and the territory being opening up to Westerners, and they're settling here, and they were started building uh, settlements and started this, that, and the other thing. Uh, but there was no recognition or celebration of the fact that uh, the indigenous people that were here before they got here had already occupied these lands, and more importantly. Uh, had it not been the, for the assistance of these indigenous people, those settlements probably wouldn't have survived at the initial stages. And that's indeed true for the country in the early uh, uh, 1600s when uh, the first settlements were emerging in the east. And if it wasn't for the uh, warm reception and help of, and assistance of the First Nations people, those early settlements never would have survived the first couple of winters. And uh, not only that, it's also recognition that throughout the history of this country, uh, our people have fought in every major war that there ever has been on behalf of this country and uh, have sacrificed their lives uh, for the principles that were outlined in the Magna Carta, in, uh, for the principles of democracy and freedom, uh, even though they weren't being afforded that full measure. And uh, today, through modern treaties and modern land claim settlements, we are now starting to enjoy that full measure and that, rec and that recognition. Uh, but this holiday is to celebrate those individuals as well who have uh, who fought uh, on behalf of uh, their own people to try to make sure that we had the equal uh, representation, 
the equal level of rights as other Canadians. At this day and age, I would say it's much better, the relationship, the working relationship. Uh, I would say the land claims, uh, uh, the umbrella final agreement that was negotiated in the Yukon Territory, I believe, have uh, uh, contributed to that uh, because the uh, the First Nations that have concluded their agreements, it's 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 a known fact that they they are not another form of the government at this level. So you have all governments uh, treating each others uh, in that manner. So it brings them to the forefront and to be recognized as another governing body. There's a heartbeat loud as thunder Revolution is in the air Hi, this is Steve Haldane for Coca-Cola and Heartbeat Alaska reminding you all to please wear your life preservers while boating. Heartbeat Alaska welcomes Steve Haldane of Coca-Cola Bottling Company in Anchorage. Steve will be traveling the state for Coca-Cola and as he goes, he'll be bringing you bits of news from remote villages. Well, I was born in Ketchikan and my parents are from Malakatl, Alaska, which is the only Indian reservation in the state of Alaska. Um, lived in Anchorage for most of my life, uh, raised up here. And Worked for the company now for 17 years. Um, started out in the food service end of the company and moved over here to Coke uh, about two years ago and just started do, taking care of rural Alaska about six months ago. So um, it's a lot of fun traveling out to the communities. People are great to work with. This, this is where we do uh, all our packaging for bypass and parcel post orders all come out of this room. We'll pull it in here by pallets and we'll band it um, and put the postage on it right here, palletize it and wrap it and it goes out to the airport from here. So we can move a lot of cases through this room. We've about 200, 250,000 cases a year we move through this room, so it's quite a bit. And, uh, the best part about traveling out there is seeing all the places I've always heard about and read about. Um, and meeting all the people is wonderful. Everybody, every place I've been, everybody's been great. Happy to see you. Um, so that makes it that makes it real nice travel. There's a heartbeat loud as thunder. Revolution is in the air. But I think here in the Yukon, uh, we're in the forefront of developing a uh, new relationships with the federal crown and the territorial government. One that brings into life a framework for self-government that's true in nature in terms of what it says, self-government for the people and by the people. And what it does is that this framework provides individual First Nations with the same equivalent powers as the federal crown, powers which I may say are protected on a provision under the Canadian Constitution and recognized under that Constitution. Over, and these powers and jurisdiction cover uh, their lands, the natural resources associated with them, and their citizens. And uh, we now enjoy direct control over 16,000 square miles of land in this territory as Aboriginal people. And on the remaining lands without the territory, we co-manage that with the Yukon government and the federal crown through various regulatory uh, instruments that we have established under our land claim. Yeah, the uh, Aboriginal influence in the uh, territory is growing and is very significant here, primarily because we have 14 First Nations in the Yukon. Seven of those have concluded their umbrella final agreements, uh, settlement of their land claims, which has provided uh, them with some certainty to the certainty to uh, to uh, land, uh, and also has provided them with uh, opportunities to invest and, and economic development across the. Uh, Territory. So, as each of these, each of the Yukon First Nations settles their land claim agreements, they're they're significant players in 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 all sectors of the economy and in forming their own governments within each of those regions. Well, first and foremost, our the, my understanding is that the Alaskan claim was really uh, brought to bear for the people through uh, corporate structures, and uh, we have not done that. We have brought to bear. Uh, land claims and brought it to fruitation through the process of establishing true levels of government, equivalent to any other level of government in terms of its recognition in the con constitutional framework. 
It has equivalent powers to the federal crown, the provinces, and the territorial legislatures. And uh, we create these entities as legal entities, as governments, not as corporations. And uh, they, have, they are governed by constitutions that were developed by the First Nation citizens themselves, speaking to how they're going to set up their system of governance, how they're going to set up their system of administrative management over their lands and resources, and how they're going to financial, how they're going to manage their financial uh, amounts. And these provisions speak also to the rights of the individual citizens. And these First Nation governments are constitutionally required under their own constitutions to abide by that uh, as the highest form of law that they have to deal with. So they could actually, anyone who violates a First Nation constitution is actually in violation of uh, the equivalent of a federal crown law and can be prosecuted for that purpose. Are there any lessons that the tribes of Alaska could learn from the First Nations of the Yukon? I think there's always an opportunity for indigenous peoples, uh, no matter where they are, to exchange ideas and, and thoughts and achievements. I know in Yukon, what's vastly different here is that the land that we retain, we hold in our own original Aboriginal title, the title that was held long before the Westerners came, and that was recognized and reaffirmed in these agreements in other settlement groups in Canada and as well, and I think in the United States, that is not the case. Any lands that are retained are either held in a reserve status or they're held in a fee simple status. We, uh, we do not do that here. We, we, our self-government flows from our inherent um, right to be self-governing, which is linked to our Aboriginal title that is linked to the land. And that's something that is fundamentally different than any other claimant group uh, nationally or internationally. Uh, I've had uh, the privilege and opportunity of meeting with uh, Russian uh, indigenous peoples, uh, indigenous peoples from the east and from the uh, South Pacific and um, uh, South Africa and there's just no way uh, that any of these type of uh, achievements can be done in those type of uh, places. And Canada is actually in the lead of uh, uh, developing true Aboriginal self-government and building true Aboriginal relationships with a federal level of government. Uh, this is quite an achievement. We have a great affinity for uh, Alaskans. I, th I think we all love where we live. I think uh, they uh, say about Alaskans and Yukoners that they're either running away from something or to something. And, uh, and uh, Alaskans are truly our neighbors. And of course, we believe in, in the Yukon that we have as much affinity that that border just happens to uh, be there, that we're all Northerners. And we have so much in common in terms of, I think, the reason that we live here and the lifestyles that we choose to live in the North. Alaska to Nova? Well, there's one thing is that uh, my First Nations are right now, uh, a number of Alaskan chiefs are coming to meet uh, with us in uh, Burwash, uh, Kiwani Lake area, not far from here. They're coming over to meet with some of our chiefs here, as well as some of the chiefs from the Northwest Territories. And we're all meeting together as Athabascan chiefs to formulate a uh, international organization to represent uh, the Athabascan peoples in the Arctic Council. And uh, the Arctic Council does a lot, is, is made up of, uh, uh, of representatives from the eight Arctic states across the circumpolar north. And uh, First Nations are provided permanent participation status on that council, and we're forming an international association of Athabascans uh, to, to get that designation. Uh, so we look forward to building a, an enhanced relationship directly with the indigenous peoples uh, and our brothers and sisters in Alaska because we held a lot of historical and traditional relationships with them. Some of our families are, are, are the same families uh, when we get close to the border and of the same nations and we're going to bring forward initiatives in cooperation with them that we bring back that historical relationship.
If you want to look good and you want to feel good, what you need to do is think about your diet and think about how much you exercise. To stay fit, she lifts weights, jogs, and eats a well-balanced diet. I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, various kinds of meats, and I love my native food. <laughs> Alaska Natives, making smart choices for a healthy future. We were trying to quit smoking. He was trying to help us. There's been a lot of information given to everybody, and I ignored it. I didn't pay no attention to it. I figured it ain't gonna happen to me. So the next guy it's gonna happen to never happen to me. Well, I was wrong. You kids can be wrong too. I'll tell you, the smart ones can read the handwriting on the wall. And the handwriting on the wall says, stay away from cigarettes. I think I better quit. Thank you, Mark Sable and residents of Whitehorse, Yukon, for your help in that story. And now for our favorite Canadian group, Cash 10. Music is sharing. The natives are sharing. The natives give, you know. It's in our culture, so we do it um, naturally. Stage and Yellowknife fucking the rocks. Ladies and gentlemen, cashed in. Chinano means us. It's for everyone who wants to share the rhythm of uh, our music. Anybody, please stand up. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure you know about. Chinano!
Thank you everyone for joining me for Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Native Information. So nice to have you with me every single week. I'd love to hear from you. Call me at 907-563-7440 or email me at www.geniegreen at ak.net. God bless every single one of you and we'll see you again right here for Heartbeat Alaska next week. Nice to meet you. 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 Nice to